All right, my name is Denny Forwood. Uh, I live in Gettysburg now, but former resident of Fairfield. Work as a Gettysburg guide uh, for about 25 years. And we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, monuments, sculptures, and some connections uh, with the Gettysburg battlefield. Have a little bit of fun with it. So uh, today we're going to talk about the GAR Memorial on the battlefield, or the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, and some of the history that goes along with it. Uh, GAR stands for the Grand Army of the Republic. Those of you who might have toured the battlefield, driven around on a tour, or followed some of the park maps, uh, most people will finish up at Pickett's Charge uh, and not pay a lot of attention off to the side of the road of a statue of a gentleman, rather elderly, sitting on a base holding a large cane. And that is Albert Wilson, and he sits on the Grand Army of the Republic monument. So I thought we'd talk a little bit more about uh, some of the details of that. The GAR is the Grand Army of the Republic. It was an organization founded uh, in 1866 after the Civil War is over. Uh, it was for Northern or Union veterans of the Army, the Navy, and the uh, Marine Corps, and it included the uh, U.S. Cutter Service. And when you find that, you kind of shake your head wondering what the U.S. Cutter Service is, but that was the enforcement arm of the U.S. government for taxes and tariffs uh, relating to ships and things coming into ports. Uh, it was founded in 1790, uh, signed on by George Washington, and so they were included as part of the members of the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, the, the, the organization was created by a gentleman uh, from Illinois in 1866. It grew rather rapidly with veterans, uh, and so it spread across the country. There are actually some posts in the southern United States uh, the Grand Army of the Republic as a veteran organization promoted, obviously, their interests, which included pensions and other uh, political things. Uh, it grew to uh, the 1890s uh, with a population or a membership of about 440,000 people in it. And from that point on, then it started to decline. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, they created a, Williams, a Women's Auxiliary that was started in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and that became the auxiliary to the uh, men's uh, version of the uh, organization. And so that, uh, that organization was around and it was terminated or ended in 18, or rather 1956 when Albert Wilson, the gentleman who's sitting on the monument, will pass away at the age of 106, could be 107 or 109, depending on which. Uh, uh, census and which records you want to take. So there's a little bit of dispute about that, but he is considered to be the last veteran of the Union Army to pass away that can be documented or certified. Uh, there are other people that claimed memberships uh, in the Army and died later, uh, but they cannot verify their, uh, that information. So uh, he gets a monument at Gettysburg, and that was put up in September of 1956, pretty much a month or so after he died. So they were preparing for his death uh, and had the monument ready to go. And so uh, that's why it's sitting there. And Wilson uh, was an interesting gentleman. Um, his father, Willard Wilson, uh, will be severely wounded at the Battle of Shiloh in the American Civil War. He will uh, ultimately die from his wounds before the war ends. And his son, Albert or, uh, Wilson, will uh, join the U.S. Army uh, in 1864 and will be mustered into a unit known as the 1st Minnesota Heavy Artillery. Uh, he will serve in that unit for a little less than a year, uh, not be involved in any actual fighting. The unit was stationed in Chattanooga, Tennessee on garrison duty, which means you were in the fort with the big cannons rather than the other ones. Uh, and so he will be mustered out, uh, go back to Minnesota. Uh, his occupation is listed as a carpenter. Uh, he also listed himself as a farmer. Uh, he will join the Grand Army of the Republic organization. Uh, and go to a lot of its or, uh, meetings and ceremonies. He'll attend the 1938 ceremony here at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for the 50th or 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, and he will attend the last encampment of the Minnesota uh, branch of the Grand Army of the Republic, uh, being probably the oldest member there, and that was in 1949. So it's a big deal when Albert Wilson uh, passes away. I'm actually old enough to remember uh, as a kid that it was a big deal on television made the news as the last veteran passed away. He gets memorialized here at Gettysburg on that monument. Uh, the auxiliary and the uh, 
uh, Sons of the Veterans Organization will put it together. Uh, and uh, that monument is done by a sculptor named uh, Fair, Avard Fairbanks. And so it kind of brings us to Avard, Avard Fairbank, Fairbanks. rather. He's an interesting sculptor, well-known sculptor. He does over 100 public works in the United States. Uh, so his works are scattered all over the country. Um, he will do three uh, works of sculpture which are in the Capitol. They may be rearranged these days, but he was in the Capitol. has three there. Uh, he will do 11 significant works of Lincoln around the country. Uh, he will do a significant amount of work uh, as by commission for the uh, Mormon Church of, in Utah, uh, often known as the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, there's several versions of uh, what you should call that. I'm not, never really quite sure, but uh, when I asked a group of uh, visitors who were all uh, members of the Mormon Church, they said it doesn't matter, so hopefully I won't get into too much trouble doing that. But Aver Fairbanks uh, was the youngest of 11 children. He was born in Provo, Utah. The family were artists. The father was a well-known sculptor at the time. He had several brothers uh, who were uh, noted sculptors or artists. His mother was a pretty good sculptor, evidently. And so uh, he, at one time, as a youngster, will join his father at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. They were doing copies of existing work, so he was working with his father for a while. Uh, as an 11-year-old, he will sculpt a uh, rabbit in clay, I presume, maybe wood, no one's not quite sure, uh, and he will win the Utah State Fair for that uh, prize. And then when the uh, judges discovered it was done by an 11-year-old, they evidently revoked the uh, prize and took it away from him. Uh, a couple of years later, when he was 15, he enters the uh, Utah State Fair again with a sculptor of a lion done in butter, and will apparently win that. I'd like to throw that in because we have butter sculptures at the farm show building here, so they, they're fairly common evidently around the country. Uh, he will go on to the University of Utah, get a degree, get a master's degree at the University of Washington, uh, move on to a uh, sabbatical at Yale University, uh, get a, uh, will study uh, on a Guggenheim Foundation scholarship in uh, Italy for a number of years, come back and uh, do a lot of uh, education work, will teach at universities and is probably responsible for instituting a number of fine arts programs in, in several Western universities. But in 1929, right before the Depression is about ready to hit, Avard Fairbanks will get a job at the University of Michigan, and he will be named the Professor of Sculptor, Sculpture. And so he will take that job. He's a little bit worried about his automobile, which as it turns out was a Willys Knight. That's the name of the car. Uh, he was worried it would not uh, start very well in the cold weather of Michigan. Uh, he didn't have the money at that point to go out and buy a new car. And so uh, living not too far away from Chrysler Corporation in Michigan, uh, they were coming out with a brand new line of cars called a Plymouth. And so he decided that if he could design a hood ornament for the Plymouth, then he might be able to uh, get barter for a new car from that uh, organization. So he designs a new uh, hood ornament. It's called the Flying Lady, uh, uh, the Flying Mermaid. Uh, he takes it over to the Chrysler Corporation, and uh, they eventually will accept it. They will use it as a uh, on their Plymouth cars when they come out, and they used it for the first two or three years of the car. It got changed uh, a little bit by one year, and then in 1934, they abandoned that and put a uh, sailing ship as a logo for a Plymouth. And you might have seen those sometimes in Plymouth uh, advertising. So he will do that. He bartered with the, uh, the Chrysler Corporation, and instead of getting a Plymouth car, they actually gave him a Dodge autom automobile, a bright red one, evidently, uh, and it was a uh, the model was their Dodge eight-cylinder engine, which was the top of the line. So it was worth a little bit more money than the Plymouth, and so he drove that uh, while he was teaching at the University of Michigan. As time goes by, according to Avard Fairbanks, he gets a call from the engineers of the Dodge Motor Division of Chrysler, and they said to him, we have 10,000 cars here uh, that need hood ornaments, and we would like to have an ornament that has conveys the idea of a Rolls-Royce with uh, its ability to kind of just stand above the others, and uh, but we were dealing with a much cheaper car. So uh, Vard Fairbanks said he went over to the Chrysler uh, people. They put him in a room, gave him a, a sleeping bed, and he modeled a number of uh, hood ornaments for them. And he said he chose 
Uh, as samples or, or recommendations, he had a cougar. Uh, he talked about a jaguar. He talked about a mountain lion uh, and a mountain goat. And so somewhere in discussing it with the engineers, he talked them into using the mountain goat or the ram, the male mountain goat, with the large horns. Uh, the engineers for Dodge decided that was a pretty good idea, and they went to talk to Walter Chrysler, the president. Chrysler wasn't so convinced about the mountain uh, goat or mountain sheep being the uh, emblem there. And supposedly Fairbanks said he convinced them to at least consider it because the big horns, when people saw the big horns on the goat, he would... Uh, they would uh, recognize it as a Dodge car. Uh, didn't do much with that. Uh, and so he went, uh, went off, took a, a sabbatical, did something, wasn't around for a while, came back and discovered that there was a parking lot full of newly manufactured Dodge cars with Ram ornaments on them. Uh, they didn't tell him they were gonna do it. And so when he inquired, they said, well, we had one of our designers modify it a little bit and we're using it. And so apparently the president of the uh, Dodge Motor Company and Fairbanks had had a discussion about copyright and so somewhere in the discussion they offered him a new car. Well he already had a Dodge car uh, so there was a cash settlement and uh, he took fourteen hundred dollars for in place of a car at that point. Uh, Avard Fairbanks will also design a hood ornament of a Griffin, if those of you are familiar with uh, this era of cars. Uh, it's a combination of a lion and an eagle, has some Egyptian uh, con uh, connections there, uh, for a company called the Hudson Motor Company. They were around, I think, since 1912. And they, uh, they wanted, uh, they were coming out with a new line of cars called the Essex. And they, the model that they were going to market was called the Terraplane, and they wanted a, a hood ornament for that. And so his griffin will become the hood ornament of the uh, Essex car which was actually considered a fairly racy car at the time. It won, I think, a Pikes Peak Championship, Climb of the Mountain, and it also set a bunch of records in the Daytona beaches at one point. Uh, you won't see many of them today, uh, but he chose to get an Essex car that time rather than the uh, cash settlement. So somewhere in all of this, uh, that Dodge uh, ornament uh, that went on so many of their vehicles will be around until almost the 1950s in various forms. At that point, uh, it was pretty much retired. And then in 2009, the Dodge Motor Company decided to separate their line of trucks into a separate line, and they called them the Ram trucks. And I think most of you are probably familiar with seeing a lot of those trucks on the, on the roads. Uh, they adopted, or Dodge gave them that logo to use as their uh, symbol for those trucks. And you'll see that in a highly... Uh, uh, rather highly... Uh, stylized form on the market. So the, uh, if you go around today and uh, drive uh, through the Gettysburg battlefield and you pause as you come across the fields of Pickett's Charge and you stop in front of the statue to, Avard Fair, uh, to Albert Wilson of Vard Fairbanks has done, uh, you'll see him gazing, oh yes, and here is the statue. Uh, you'll see him gazing across the battlefield. If you go around the statue and look over his shoulder, you will see that he is actually probably gazing here at Fairfield, Pennsylvania and Liberty Mountain, which is just across the street. You get a rather clear view of it. Uh, and if a big truck rumbles up next to you uh, while you're looking at the monument and blocks your view, kind of puts you in the shadows, it's more than likely one huge Dodge truck that has that as a symbol on the side of it. This is Gettysburg National Military Park, and that is the Grand Army of the Republic monument with Albert Wilson sitting on top of it, the last veteran to pass away on the Union side of the Civil War. Uh, this is Avard Fairbanks' statue atop the Kensington Temple, the uh, Mormon Temple in Washington, D.C. Avard Fairbanks statue or hood ornament for the Plymouth car in the 1930s. That was a hood ornament for the Hudson Terraplane or Essex Terraplane 6 car that uh, a 
board to Fairbanks Design. This is the hood ornament for the Dodge, the 1930 Dodge, the hood ornament that he designed. And this is a stylized Dodge truck emblem that Avard Fairbanks uh, designed for Dodge and was carried over to their truck division.